that will do this function at a lower cost, at a lower natural resource usage, at a lower wastage potential, at a lower energy potential. Then it's not sustainable unless you have that you cannot say one is sustainable and one is not. Wood is sustainable than concrete. If you're building an individual house in a place that there are no termites, in a place that there is absolutely no rotting, in a place that there is no rain, yes, wood is more sustainable than concrete, provided the, the tree lovers are not coming after you for having cut a tree. Asphalt is more sustainable than concrete, which it never happens, but if you, you can make an argument for it. Asphalt is more sustainable if they develop a process whereby refinement of petroleum does not cause the energy and environmental impact that it causes now. Steel can be more sustainable than concrete if production of steel at some point of time releases less carbon dioxide to the environment and steel can do everything that concrete does at the same cost as concrete. Think about putting a steel bridge deck. You will know the cost. So sustainable, you have to think of this. So the argument for this, don't be defensive when somebody says concrete is not sustainable. You say, I agree to you 100%. Don't give me a, a problem, give me a solution. What do you have? So we are trying to make concrete sustainable within the limitations that we have. And you've heard about people designing I'll give you a classic example. And the project didn't work, uh, work out because of a lot of other issues. A lot of nuclear waste in the US. Because we have a lot of nuclear power plants, a lot of nuclear waste. Many of the nuclear waste are dumped. They put in big caskets uh, and dump in the Atlantic Ocean. OK? So when you fly over Atlantic, be careful. A lot of caskets. Now what they've decided was that they have to take all these things and store in somewhere in the earth itself. So in Nevada, near Las Vegas, you know, all of you know Las Vegas, right? Gambling place. Uh, near Las Vegas, there's a big mountain called Yucca Mountain. It's a, nobody lives in that neighborhood. It's, it's a very deserted area. So they decided that they will drill the Yucca Mountain out, dump the nuclear waste in, and cover it with what? Concrete. With a service life of how many years? Guess, take a guess. 1,000 years. Design a concrete to last 1,000 years. And they designed the concrete. They did the testing. They did a lot of long-term testing. And the project was, was about to, to move. But the problem was Nevada is out there. If you look at US, it's a large country. Nevada is out there in the west, and Atlantic Ocean is out in the east. A lot of nuclear reactors are on the east coast. How do you transport all this nuclear waste from east to the west 3,000 miles, about 5,000 kilometers? How do you transport that? They came up with a way. We'll put a new rail line. We'll use existing rail lines. And America doesn't have too much of rail lines. They have only, um, only cargo rail lines. Put in some rail lines. We'll add some more rail lines. But the people who are living in the areas where the rails go through started revolting. No, no nuclear waste through my area. What happens if the train crashes? What happens if the train derails in my area? Right? Right concern. And lots of people started revolting and the project didn't go. But the entire design, entire process of design was completed. Thousand year concrete. Think about it. 20% OPC concrete. OPC is clinger, clinger fraction of 20%. And they designed it. And they did a lot of testing, extremely dense. I mean, you can look at the microstructure, and you will see nothing but solids. Very, 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 very little pores. And then, of course, there were treatments and stuff. And this concrete was supposed to be the 8 meters thick. So you now know why it's only 20% cement, right? Because how do you make such thick concrete? Otherwise, if you put in more cement. Um, and they designed it, but, but again, that is material by design. All the bridge decks in the United States now, so they have classification for how bridge decks have to be, have to be designed. Uh, all the bridge decks, and there are guideline specifications, but if there are no standard concrete mix designs for any one bridge deck. The Department of Transportation, once they decide to have a bridge deck there, they will do trial mixes and they'll come to universities to do a lot of testing and we'll do a lot of testing and then within their guidelines we will design a material we will design a combination for what they want so nobody uses 
a standard. So that's what I'm very surprised and some and, and to a point where, where I'm, I'm kind of being disillusioned when we always rely on a strength grade concrete for specifications. M30, M40, M50, why? Why should you have an M40 concrete or M50 concrete? Right? So you, you're, you, if you have to move away from prescriptive specifications, you have to design the material for the purpose it is serving, it has to serve for. You, we have a lot of underwater marine concrete, okay? And a lot of them corrode also, but you can see an amazing number of concrete structures even after 10, 15, 20 years in the marine environment with absolutely no corrosion. Army Corps of Engineers, the military, does a lot of those marine structures for, for the US Navy, for the wharves. And you will see all those 15, 20, 30 year old structures with absolutely spotless, no corrosion. But you go to, go to um, Cochin Harbor, you feel so bad. You see the amount of corrosion that you have. Again, the idea that we have not designed materials. We have the tools, we have the resources, we have the money. But we just didn't do it for the right purpose. Okay. 3D from 2D inspections, that's what I was talking about. Again, the other thing is that um, size of particles, size of fly ash. So if you do a plain polish section, you can cut a sphere any way you want, right? And if I cut a sphere and look at a microscope like this, what am I seeing? That. And I take that diameter and say my fly ash is 20 microns. If I, if I happen to cut here, I'll say my fly ash is 40 microns. If I cut somewhere else, I say my fly ash is something else, right? So in a 3D, it depends on where you cut, you can have different values. So stereology helps you account for, for those effects also. Now, random pore structure. This is another tool that I want to give you. Weibull distribution, all of you have seen Weibull distribution in the statistics class. Very useful for any random phenomena. People use Weibull for strength distribution also. So if you have pore structure that's very different, you can do some Weibull distribution to find out dispersion, connectivity, spatial arrangements. You can do some Weibull distributions of that. Weibull parameters so you can, you can find out what they are. Um, this is a good thing that you can do with image J. And you can even do this to supplement. And so, one of the drawbacks of the MIP, what was the drawback of mercury intrusion porosimetry? The pores that are constricted, right? So the ink bottle pore effect. That could be overcome by using image analysis. So if you take an SEM image or multiple SEM images, you can do what's called granulometry, and I'll show you what that is, okay? So here is an image, pores and solids, right? you can do, you can open the images. So basically, I say I'm using a structuring element, typically a circle. I'm using a structuring element of one millimeter, which just means anything lower than one millimeter I close. Can you see the difference between these two pictures? Anything lower than one millimeter I've closed off and I find out how much I have closed off. So this I'm just showing two, one and two mm. But you can do from, do for a range of sizes. I can do 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Again, image very quickly done, right? So I can use a structure. Again, these are tools that you can very easily use. So I can use a structuring element of a certain size and close off pores sequentially, virtually close off pores sequentially in images. So if I use a structuring element of two, L, two mm, anything lower than two mm is ignored, right? And then I plot the radius of structuring element as a function of what is remaining. Say the radius of here is 1 mm, the radius here is 2 mm. So I use a number of different points. I find out now the area fraction of remaining. So at 0, I have all the area here, right? At 2, I have only this much area left. You see that? And then I get this red curve. All of you get the idea? Again, very powerful, very interesting idea. Now I take the first derivative of that graph, which I show in the purple line. Use that first derivative of the graph. Again, if you use a program like MATLAB and dump in all the points, ask him to give the derivative, it will happily give you the derivative. If you are happy doing a doing lot of manual labor, you can do derivative x1 minus x, y1 minus y2 over x1 minus x2 in Excel. That also can give you the derivative. Okay? So you keep this. Now, if I get the peak, I get a critical size. 
Does this ring a bell somewhere? Have you seen this before? A little while before? In the morning? What was it? That is what I saw told is the critical size that you get from MIP, right? You get the exact same critical stress from MIP through image analysis without the downside of MIP, which is the ink bottle pore effect. Here the image doesn't care if the, 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 the pore is, is constructed or not. And if you do this on a sequential number of images, you get a very good representation of what the actual structure is. If you have a smart student who can do programming, you can automate the entire process. It could be a nice, uh, uh, a nice M-Tech thesis or something. It will take three, four months of a student's time if they know how to program. Basically, take all the images. So basically, you have MATLAB can read images as text files. You make the, it read as so. You do thresholding of images in image J. Label the images. Ask MATLAB to read image number 1 through 100 as text files. Ask it to do the granulometry. So write a subroutine for granulometry. Ask it to do the granulometry on each of those images. Ask it to, uh, to, to throw out, spit out the results in each of those. Each of those plots. You do a statistical analysis. You come up with exact percolation threshold, percolation pore size in these structures. Very, very, very powerful tool. Very, very, very powerful characterization method where if you are doing, uh, you know, if you want to understand what the post structure and post size are, if you don't have, that's why I said, if you don't have MIP, don't bother. If you, if you can do get a few images, you can work on this. Okay? That's one way of, of doing it. So it's useful in determining the percolating pore dimension. Percolating pore dimension is the most important pore dimension because percolation means transport, right? If it starts to percolate, if you get to that percolating size, that is a size beyond which you will have transfer through those pores very fast. So you know what that size is and your, your aim should be to make sure that you have the right percolating size. Okay, same idea again, another picture from another, another set of images. So you get another percolating radius. Percolation correlation, so that takes you to percolation. Um, Correlation functions, I'll show you. Okay. Here is nearest neighbor probability density. So I have I have different particles in a medium. And so I can I can define what is the probability of finding a neighbor at a certain distance. Same idea I told you, right? Seminal limestone, for example. Seminal fly ash, for example. What's the probability? So you want to have really homogeneous microstructures. Where this comes very handy. Um, is that, an, and I've used this in, in real life. So there was, there was one, one um, uh, project in which the Redimix guy had some issues with their software. And instead of cement, the fly ash silo got released. Instead of fly ash, the cement silo got released because of some software error in their controls. So basically, they had designed for 20% fly ash, it effectively become an 80% fly ash system. But they realized that before the concrete was placed. While it was the truck, so they, they take about an hour to do the truck, right? Um, the truck goes somewhere, and there's, in the US, there are no site mixed concrete, it's all ready mixed. So when the, the ready mixed guys, they figured out that this truck had a problem within 20 minutes of the truck leaving the plant. So now their option is to dump the entire thing or to find out if, if they can do something else to manipulate it. So, um, so they actually then added extra amounts of silica fume in that mix and it was, it was not a concrete that was requiring very high strength so that saved them. They added extra amount of silica fume and then inside uh, they got some steel fibers and added some steel fibers also so that it, it gets some additional strength. So they did that and saved that load of concrete. They had to spend some money, but they saved that load of concrete. But then they wanted to investigate if what they did with silica fume, right? Silica fume, very fine particles. So silica fume will distribute throughout and then will start to react. So a lot of calcium hydroxide will be consumed, uh, but the problem is 20% cement will have very little calcium hydroxide produced. So now a lot of your silica fume will stay as silica particles because there's no calcium hydroxide to react. 
and then they'll, they'll, they will never react. They'll stay as silica particles. Which is okay, they'll fill some pores and they, you, can, you can still get some benefits. So, because it was only 20% cement, they want to make sure that the 20% cement is, a, is as dispersed as possible. What happens when you have a lot of fly ash? I don't know if you have noticed this. Fly ash helps increase the workability, right? And when, so you have this ball bearing effect. When two fly ash particles come and close to each other, they interact, they spread, they move nicely, right? So, after, try this. After mixing extremely high amounts of fly ash with small amounts of cement, you will see localized places where there's only fly ash. And cement starts to segregate in certain other areas. Partly because of the size effects and partly because of the fact that fly ash is very mobile, it tends to move among themselves, ignoring the fact that cement particles are there, especially when you have large. If you have small amounts of fly ash, they act like ball bearings. They go everywhere and, and spread it out, but large amounts of fly ash, the cement gets. So basically, then it becomes a useless idea, right? So wherever there is cement, you might have some denser structure, but the other place is going to be very weak. So we did a pair correlation function to see what the nearest neighbors are. Again, a lot of SEM images and do correlation functions. The process was made much easier because the cement hardly had reacted. So we could, we could do that fairly easily. So probably that an arbitrary particle lies uh, nearer to a particle. And again, there are, there are functions that you can do, mathematical functions that you can use. I'll skip all of that just to give you the idea. One point correlation, I showed you the idea, throw different dots. So here is the red point. If I throw enough number of red points, I can find out what the fraction of yellow or fraction of red or fraction of blue is in the structure. Similar to the idea of one point correlation function, I can have two point correlation function. And this becomes an even powerful method. Image J can do it. This becomes a, a better method Instead of throwing a dart, a point, now I throw a small stick into it. And then I find out whether the stick that I threw in lies entirely in one face, lies intersecting one face, or lies with one face here and one face here. Right? So now you determine the probability that two ends are in the same face. So these are all how the system is correlated. Again, going back to my idea of materials by design, finding out what is the correlation between the different materials that you have in the system to ensure that they act synergistically. It's all about synergy. Okay, so you throw lines and then you create curves like this, length of the line. So initially you throw a dart. So the length of the dart is? Zero, then to the point. And then you throw a 1 mm line. If I throw a 1 mm line, I can see that about 20% of the area can be covered. And then if I throw a larger line, I have less probability that the line will lie in one face, right? You see the idea? The longer the line, the lower the probability that the line will be in one face. So that's what you're seeing. But very interestingly, and this is universal theory, very interestingly, you will find out after some time, it doesn't matter what the length of the line is. Nothing changes. Right? You get a curve like this, and this curve is very interesting for two reasons. One, if I get to a point where I'm doing the zero, zero length line, zero length lines are nothing but points, I get the volume fraction. Like I used to get the last time, just throw darts, right? The point that I have where it is plateauing is the square of my porosity. Okay? That is always, 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 and there is mathematical theory for it. It's always, always, always the square of your porosity. And if I draw a tangent at the intersect initial point, right? Draw a tangent to the line at the initial point and look at where it intersects the horizontal. So intersection of the tangent and the horizontal, which is this point, I can use that point, a critical length, along with the porosity to find a critical size of that face. That critical size, again, is related to the percolation size. 
Okay, so now you have another tool. Not done. You take the second derivative of this function. Second derivative of, the, sorry, the first derivative of this function with respect to line, with, with respect to the length and set the limit of L tending to zero, you get one fourth of the specific surface area of the pores. Right? Specific surface area is extremely hard to determine otherwise. Now, image analysis and a little bit of mathematics gives you a way to find out the specific surface area of pores. And specific surface area is important in a lot of different things. Can you give me one example where the specific surface area of pores are important? Yes. 